We get uh, a treat today. We get Dan Saporin from Canaan Partners and Steve McLaughlin from um, FT Partners, um, who are going to talk about M&A in the fintech space. These are probably two of the most highly qualified individuals to talk about um, you know, investment banking, M&A, deals in finance and, and, and fintech. So I'm very eager to hear what they have to say. And I think you're going to see that they have a lot of fun together. And please uh, help me in welcoming to the, to them to the stage. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. Hello. Good to see everybody out there. Um, so thanks for all for coming. I have the uh, privilege and honor of uh, talking to Mr. McLaughlin here. Uh, who I've known for quite some time now, but for those of you who don't know him, I'm going to give you a little introduction. There you um, go. Here we Can't go. <laughs> uh, so Steve is the founder, CEO, and managing partner of Financial Technology Partners, uh, which is the only investment bank that's exclusively focused on fintech. Uh, offices in San Francisco, New York City, London. He founded the firm, little known fact, at age 32. Uh, and some notable deals he's had in the past are $4.5 billion deal selling uh, Heartland to Global Payments, $3.6 billion valuation he got for Green Sky Credit from Fifth Third Bank, and uh, most recently um, just negotiated or helped uh, negotiate the uh, $5 billion forward flow agreement that Prosper uh, signed up with. So uh, a guy that is uh, very, very knowledgeable about the uh, wonderful world of fintech, uh, and particularly on the M&A and investment banking side. He also happens to be the only banker, fintech or otherwise, that I know of who's on a first name basis with Snoop Dogg. There you go. So that's, a, that's the real claim to fame. Um, okay, so Steve, let's talk about, um, let's talk about what's happening in M&A. Uh, as you uh, know, it's not necessarily a very pretty picture. Uh, in terms of last year. So uh, I think the numbers I have here from KPMG are uh, M&A activity down in 2016 by 68% from 2015 and actually down 52% compared to 2014. So what's going on? What do you think has uh, uh, contributed to the decline last year and where do you think we're going? Is, is, uh, is the M&A... Uh, is the M&A pace going to pick up significantly, or, is, or are we uh, sort of still need to have our seatbelts on here? Good question. First of all, thank you, Dan, for uh, doing this today, and thanks for lending for having us here. Great to be here again. Um, you know, on the M&A question, you don't, we don't really look that much at the big statistics like that. It's, uh, it's really what's going on in the trenches. You know, the, st the stats are kind of skewed. In 15, you had the Visa, you know, Visa Europe deal for $28 billion. So some of the stats are a little skewed. I do think, though, one of the trends on M&A being a little light, which I agree, is because financing activity has been so great. Um, and that's also down a little bit as well. But at the end of the day, if you can go out and get you know, financing round after round after round, you don't really need to get bought. So there's been a lot of companies that could have gotten bought to keep raising capital. So I think that um, the numbers are a little skewed. That being said, there hasn't been a lot of M&A uh, heretofore. The, the FinTech revolution is upon us, but you, if you look at uh, across LendIt, you look at uh, the lending clubs of the world, Prosper's, Green Skies, you know, uh, some of the great companies out there, there really hasn't been a lot of M&A. So it's worth talking about why, why is that? Um, well, first of all, who's gonna buy these companies for you know, four or five billion dollars you know, when they're still in the young earning stage? And so certainly it's not gonna be the banks. They can't do it because of goodwill. Uh, the e-commerce companies, you're starting to see some of that come in. Maybe we can talk about that later. Uh, but you're not seeing a Google or a Facebook or uh, those kind of guys sort of step into the U.S. and get those kind of big deals done. So, um, you know, I think uh, for now, uh, there's been a bit of an M&A um, lull in terms of some of the, the, the more popular definition of fintech. The big numbers you hear about in M&A when you have billions and billions of dollars, it's, uh, you know, we sold Harlan payments for almost $5 billion to Global. You know, so that's sort of these long-term, you know, bigger companies getting sold that are popping up the numbers. It's, it's not a lot of the smaller companies out there. You did see in the wealth management space, 
uh, BlackRock by Future Advisor and, and a few other deals, but you're not really seeing it so much in the lending space. So uh, let's start with one deal that ha just happened in 2017 uh, where, to your point, uh, it was not in the lending space. It was uh, Ant Financial yep. uh, buying MoneyGram for $880 million uh, just in January. So um, where do you think that the sectors are that, uh, that are really going to be hot this year? Hot this uh, year? Re remittances is obviously uh, MoneyGram. You seem to feel that lending, the lending space itself, at least for this year, may not, um, may not have the kind of traction that, uh, that it looked like it, it had uh, you know, several years ago. What do you think is really um, in buyers' minds these days as far as fintech is concerned, yeah. as far as sectors? Well, back to the lending space, I mean, you, what you might see is you might see some in-market M&A. You saw SoFi buy an online bank. You might see them buy some other things. You could see some of the lending companies getting together, some of the smaller companies getting picked up by some of the bigger ones that have capital and brand name. Um, so that, that wouldn't surprise me at all, uh, but it would, I would still be surprised to see a large bank come and, and, and do a big deal in, in the alternative lending space. Um, these days. In terms of Amp Financial and other folks doing those kind of deals, you know, we, we, that deal is a couple billion dollar deal. It did catch a lot of people by surprise, quite frankly, uh, but you've seen a lot of the Chinese firms coming into the U.S. asset market bought by Hutai. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that uh, for the Chinese folks in the room, but uh, in any event, uh, you are seeing a lot of that M&A. You're seeing um, an insure tech, you know, we actually just did a deal for a company called uh, Square Trade, it was a one and a half billion dollar deal bought by Allstate. I think that shocked a lot of people. So, you know, that's a great example of a, of a large FI coming into the space of FinTech and doing something. It was a billion and a half dollar deal, no earnings deal. And so that was pretty exciting. Um, I can't say who, but we actually represented a fairly large insurance company on uh, a fairly large M&A deal that they couldn't get done because, again, someone else did and financed a, a company for a pretty big valuation. So you're starting to see, I think, the insurance space and other folks start to come in and look at deals. You're seeing a lot of financial investment by strategics as well, which is another reason that sort of you're not seeing as much M&A. So, you know, if you look at um, some of the big corporates, you've seen a lot of corporate venture capital groups get set up that are, you know, really kind of being very active, whether it's Santander or BBVA with Propel and others. So you're seeing a lot of that. In terms of, you know, some of the other deals recently, if you just pick a couple, you look at uh, PayPal just bought TO Networks, which is a walk-in bill payment, sort of underbanked kind of business. So you're seeing a lot, and that's the same, same theme with the, the remittance space. They also bought Zoom a, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. So, um, but I'm, I'm really not seeing a huge M&A wave coming in. I think we're probably, and I've been saying this, you know, maybe five or six years away from a lot of the, some of the bigger e-commerce companies really getting into fintech. So you got the big financial services companies a little crippled to get in. You got the big e-commerce companies, their minds on lots of different things. So there's a little bit of a, that glut still there. So it's fascinating to me that you said the insurance companies, or at least in Allstate in the case of Square Trading, um, you know, bought, effectively bought a company in a similar way that uh, tech companies buy uh, strategic yep. assets. Uh, the you well, know, what you're seeing, we're seeing. It there, there's well, there's, there's a whole uh, school of thought. You know, insurance companies, financial companies, they're not going to buy companies that are not accretive, right? Right. Uh, but that's not the case here. Obviously, is that so? Other than insurance companies, do you see? Do we ever see uh, big well, banks, big financial institutions doing non-accretive strategic purchases? Not much in the way of revenues, but they really love the technology. They love the the, the product, and they're going to buy it on that basis for for big money. Unfortunately, not as much as you'd like to, but getting in the minds of some of these folks has been really interesting. Um, you know, we're, we're normally on the sell side, and so we have worked on a few buy side deals. We represented BlackRock on the Future Advisor deal, Ally Financial on a deal, Fifth Third on a deal, and, you know, and Mass, uh, CIBC and some other uh, big banks. And so, and not picking on any of them, and some of the ones that we worked on where the deal didn't happen, the thing that I appreciated most about it is some of these guys are looking at it as, as a 25-year vision. You know, they're not looking at it for the next two or three years. You've really got to look 20 years out and say, look, my business is, is going to get reinvented. In the case of Allstate, they're looking at telematics, looking at Uber, they're looking at people not buying you know, home insurance as early, and they're saying, hey, Square Trade was a, was a warranty company, so 12, 13 million you know, warranties a year. And they said, look, if we can get in earlier stage with these consumers and be with them as they grow up, we can get, a, get in their wallet earlier. And, and if they're not buying car insurance, they're buying some other kind of insurance from us. So much longer story than that. But 
we're seeing some of these firms look very long term. The insurance company that we represented that didn't end up buying something in the wealth management space because it got uh, a pretty big financing was looking very long term. They didn't care that it was burning quite a bit of money and uh, they were willing to take a leap. But that's you know one in 50 firms you're seeing do that. You're not, I don't think you're seeing boardrooms and Jamie Dimey sitting around saying, you know, I really am worried about, you know, uh, consumer lending and I need to go buy something tomorrow. So I think as the prices you know, become a little bit more reasonable, as the companies get a little bit more profitable um, and things with synergies get a little bit more creative, I think you, um, you may see some more of that activity. But people have to think long term and we're not seeing enough of it, quite frankly. So in thinking about the, um, the fintech companies out there that are at very high price valuations, I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 20 plus uh, companies that are deemed to be fintech that are unicorns, meaning their valuations are a billion dollars or more. Um, which of those do you think is a, a good candidate for a real crash and burn here? <laughs> Can't you ask me which ones I think are going to do well? <laughs> <laughs> That's the next uh, question. I mean, I'm not going to name names of firms that I don't think are going to do well. They're in the kind of unicorn camp. But a lot of the ones you're talking about that were, were in the unicorn camp may not be there anymore just because the valuations have come down. But um, look, it's, there's still some companies out there that haven't figured out how to really make money sustainably. And so... Uh, and some companies who valuation, whose valuations have gotten way ahead of them. Um, some of the companies I sort of admire are you know, a Square, for example, who a lot of people had, I think, counted out. There's a lot, an enormous number of doubters on Square, and they've come off and their IPOs now doubled. So um, some of the companies that focus and, and raise enough money, and I think that's a key question, raising enough money. One of the things I have to commend you guys on and Lending Club is actually, you know, going public and raising a billion dollars or more, and having that war chest there when tough times hit, right? Um, and uh, that calmed the market down. You know, some of the best companies that we know have raised a lot of capital when the capital was available, even when they didn't need it. And then when times got tough, they just sort of put their head down, executed, and that's one. What, of course, you know, it's good news for us. But yeah, raising a lot of capital when it's there is a good thing because you're going to need it when the uh, when the sun isn't shining. So you I dodged your question. Yeah. <laughs> Successfully, okay. Yeah. You want to you want to tell us who uh, who who you think is is really going to uh, more than justify that unicorn status? Um, you know, I mean, look. I think in the lending space, you know, we like we like people that, that are already making money, quite frankly. And so you look at a SoFi or a Loan Depot or a Green Sky who are making significant money and growing very fast. I think those are the guys that are going to clean up. Um, uh, obviously. Uh, there's a bunch of companies that are they're not yet making money. They're somewhat special, like an upstart who was in here a little while ago, or an earnest, uh, some of our clients, by the way. So there are free props for those guys. I get a T-shirt later or something for that. But, uh, but no, we, we try to pick the clients that are going to you know, go up and up. And so you know, that's, been, that's been helpful. So on the payment side, um, certainly we like Square, you know, Audien, Stripe, some of the guys that are really differentiated and going international. Companies like Yapstone, Marquetta, and others that are really innovating in their spaces. You know, Marquetta, for example, is, you know, when, when we met them, we're doing a million dollars in revenue a year and a half ago. Now they're doing, you know, 40 million run rate or plus or minus. And, you know, there's, there's a few companies that are really starting to take off in the insurance space. You know, there, there's, a, there's a number of them, uh, Metro Mile and others. So, but I think that's one of the things that's happening. There's, you go to some of these conferences and there's a zillion companies, you know, it, it, you know trying to get up there. And it's, it kind of boils down to one or two per space. You know, you're not seeing you know, 15 lending clubs and prospers, you know, get to be $10 billion companies, you're going to see a few per space. So that, that's what we're excited about. Trying to, we're like a venture capitalist trying to hunt those good companies down. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so thinking about public companies and in particular uh, lending club on deck, two obvious examples, lending club being obviously a marketplace lending company, on deck being more of a balance sheet um, lender in a different space, the SMB yep. space. But if you think about you know, where those multiples have gone, they both went public at roughly the same time. Um, they both obviously started out with multiples that are, were uh, significantly higher than they are today. Um, is that a temporary phenomenon? Is, it, is there a decoupling of private valuations from public? Uh, what's, your, what's your overall take on how to think about valuations for fintech or lending in particular. So if I just raised it four billion, um, sure, and, I, uh, and and you know from an origination standpoint, yeah, one could certainly argue that uh, the multiple there is 
much, much higher than, um, than lending clubs, for example. So how do, you, how do you explain that? I think the coupling, decoupling is a good place to start. I think in the private markets, one thing you, you, you think about over the course of time is you really need one person in the world to price your deal, right? In the public markets, you need an equilibrium of everyone in the world that comes up with a price. So there could be, there has to be a lot of people that believe in you in order to get there. But on, a, on the private market, because there's preferreds and people are tricking up securities and things like that, it, it tends to have an inflation of value. So. Uh, in terms of the nominal value. So, you know, you get into a, a SoFi or someone, you got a 1x preferred or, you know, some other securities and some other deals we've seen are, you know, 2x preferreds or, you know, guaranteeing 8 or 9 or 10% downside protection, you're going to see a very different type of valuation. Um, and again... So ap apples to oranges, in effect. It's, it's somewhat apples to oranges, but I think the, the, the key thing we found is that, you know, it only does take one in the private market. You can look all around the world, you look at a wealth front or or someone like that who got $100 million from Shinovic in, in, in Europe. And, you know, that's one investor that thinks it's worth whatever it's worth, right? Um, if, if, if they had to go ask every single, you know, company in Silicon Valley, what are they worth? Who knows what the number would be, right? It's going to be less just because, they, 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 you know, you, you tend to top tick things when you're talking to, you know, one investor about one deal. In the public markets, um, there's more punishment. Um, if you miss a quarter, you know, you're going to be hit hard. You know, there's a lot of expectations. And I think Lenny Club, um, which we think is a great company and it will do very well long term, um, you know, had a number of hiccups in the market. And so once you have a hiccup or two, the market just sort of gets nervous and, and the air comes out. So you've got to recover very quickly. And it can take six or eight or nine quarters to come back and, and convince the market that what you've got is, is what you said it was before. So at the end of the day, the, the, the multiples should be rel relative to the growth rates and the profitability. And one of the, one of the things people tend to forget about is in these balance sheet businesses, there's a lot of capital that needs to get infused into the business over the course of time. So as you grow, more and more capital needs to be shoveled into the business as opposed to dividend and out of the business are available for M&A and those kind of things. So the capital light models are always likely to have a lot higher multiple, but it doesn't mean they're going to be worth more. At the end of the day, um, if you look at a Capital One, $60, $70 billion business, right, and, and now there's rumors that Amazon's going to buy it, who knows, but, um, uh, you know, I'd rather be, uh, you know, Capital One than a marketplace business these days. Yeah. $60, $70 billion yeah. market cap, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what's your take on the, the rumors, uh, Amazon buying Capital One? Uh, Let's put aside for a minute if they're true or not. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Can't, is, can't say everything we buy? know about that, yeah. but I'd say, um, I'd say that um, I think it would make a ton of sense. Um, I, I talked at the very beginning about the e-commerce companies not really getting that much into financial services. They are dabbling in it, um, quite frankly. And, and if you look at Amazon, they're, they're already pretty big in the credit card business. They're, they're, they're you know, likely to, to do more and more in that space. Um, because they've got the customer. If they've got the customer, uh, they're, they're probably getting a huge portion of the customer's wallet share every month, buying everything on Amazon. So they've got the customer, you know, uh, one touch buy. They've got uh, deep customer relationship. They have all the data and information. Imagine all the, the data Amazon has on everyone in this room and all the stuff that you buy from them and how, uh, and how your life is going. So that's, that's a huge amount of data they've got on you. So I, I think it would make a ton of sense for them to do that, but I'm not advocating it. But uh, uh, they certainly got the capital to do it. So let's go back to the uh, to your the deal you just did with Prosper, uh, where um, Prosper got a forward flow agreement of I think five billion dollars, and in return gave up. I guess it's not public, uh, but certainly uh, rumored to be a significant portion of the company. Um, how do you how do you see uh, that process continuing? And by that I mean. If Lending Club did nine billion or almost nine billion dollars in originations last year, um, now Prosper's raised five billion. Where once they run through that money, what happens? Do they have to give up yet more of the company? Do you think that they're then in a position where uh, they're they're more stable and therefore would not have to do that? What's yeah, no, your, I don't. Your, I don't think they're going to have to give any any more of the company up to anybody. I think that uh, at the end of the day, it's it's five billion dollars. It's a portion of the flow over multiple years. So it's really just a bolstering and a, and a confidence builder, I think, for the market. Um, I think there are. Uh, I know there are a lot of other people that are jumping on the bandwagon and saying, "Hey, the water's great." Um, quite frankly, the Prosper loans have performed incredibly well. Everyone's made money investing in them, and so I think uh, it's it's going to be. Uh, I think um, upwards from here for these guys um, and, and Lending Club, I think as well. I think the good news 
and we had to do a deep dive in all these different companies and pools of loans, is the loans have performed great. The, what happened was there were temporary blips in credit and temporary blips in, in lending uh, volumes uh, in terms of the leverage that's availability that was available, um, you know, had a blip in the market. And Lending Club had had their little issue, um, and that sort of spooked people for a little while. But I think all that stuff's been cleared up, and uh, I think uh, both those companies have been in great shape. So we're uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, let me, uh, if I can, sort of wrap up with a question on. Um, you know, for lack of a better term, what is fintech? And by what is fintech versus fin, and what part of it is tech? Uh, you know, I guess I would ask you, what makes a company interesting as a fintech company, as a unique and differentiating and innovative play versus just another specialty finance company that happens to be online? Sure. You know, we sometimes joke around internally and say, look, you know, all the financial services are headed towards fintech, right? And all the fast-growing companies are going to slowly overtake or, you know, become much larger companies. Like a Capital One was once thought of as a fintech company in, in the 90s and so on and so forth. Um, I think the difference is, you know, it, it, you know are, you, are you growing fast? Are you doing something different? You know, at the end of the day, um, the thing I like to laugh about is people like to talk about these companies being disruptive. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not thinking that... Lending Club or Prosper is all that disruptive. You're, help, you know, you're making loans, et cetera, but you're doing it at a very fast rate of growth, um, and you're differentiating yourself versus the banks at a moment in time where, where they're kind of down on their, on, their, uh, um, on their ability to innovate, quite frankly. So you know, what, what we look for is people that are innovative, great management teams, growing, and, and really um, you know, fintech is a nice term for the tech side of things, but you can have a lot of tech and, and a bad business model. It's not going to matter. You've got a lot of AI, and you apply it to the wrong thing and do the wrong stuff. It's not going to matter. If you get a company growing at the right rate, you know, then people are going to call it fintech. Even if it's a balance sheet business growing fast, it's fintech. If it's a tech business growing slow, it's you know, worse than a balance sheet business. So I think it's, it's all about the growth at the end of the day and how you can make three, four, five times your money, and, and the rest is history. Or even more. Yeah, or even more. Or even more. <laughs> Ten times. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, thank you, Steve. Dan, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to listen. Thank you.